see some old friends in the room and some new faces too. Uh, um, it's great to see all of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mengus Maps. I'm one of your commissioners on Portland City Council. Um, um, I'm the commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and the Bureau of Emergency Communications, which is basically 911. If you have any concerns about um, any of those three bureaus, uh, please do bring them up. Uh, the buck really does stop with me um, in those spaces. Um, at the same time, in addition to those bureaus, of course, I have all the responsibilities and all the concerns that um, any city commissioner would have uh, that, you know, concerns that stand beyond my bureaus. What I thought I'd do is just take um, a couple of minutes to highlight some of the issues that we've been working on uh, over the last several months, um, which I suspect will be of interest to many of the people in the room. Um, I figured that you would likely um, be interested in updates on um, public safety issues, houselessness, and livability, sort of trash and graffiti. Um, and as we all know, if you spend any time in Portland, and obviously you all do, uh, we have challenges there. But at the same time, I think that we've made some important progress um, over the course of the last six months in particular or so. Um, why don't I quickly start with public safety? Um, you know, um, I came into 2022 with some very clear goals around public safety. Uh, we all remember that last year, 2021, was literally the deadliest year in Portland's history. We had about 90 homicides. Uh, by comparison, if you were to go back even five years, the city had 12. Uh, so something really remarkable and frankly tragic has uh, um, taken place. Uh, um, and it's my, uh, one of my top concerns Concerns to bring down that homicide rate. Uh, the good news is, uh, you know, uh, thanks to the partnership that um, we have with the community and my colleagues on council, I think we've been able to implement some important reforms which are moving us towards a safer city. Uh, so, for example, literally within this this calendar year, uh, the Police Bureau has uh, launched a new uh, unit within the police department, the Focused Intervention Team, which specifically focuses in on gun crime. Uh, they've been out there working for about six months. Uh, they're doing amazing work. If you read the newspapers on the weekends and you're reading a crime story, someone got arrested uh, uh, for a homicide or got pulled over uh, um, and some guns were taken away, that's probably due to the work of um, of our focus intervention team. You know, they've only been up for about half a year now. So the um, we have a lot to learn, uh, but um, I'm proud of the fact that they're, they're up, they're doing work, they're making arrests, they're getting guns off the street. And I think they're making our city safer. Another important um, theme around public safety is the fact that um, our police bureau is radically um, understaffed uh, um, at this point, you know, for a city the size of Portland, you'd expect us to have about 1,200 police officers. Um, as of today, we are below 800. Um, that's a problem that we have to solve. Um, but there's good news there too. Um, the city has actually done a much better job, especially in the last half a year or so at recruiting. Um, in fact, I believe on Wednesday, we'll be, we will be swearing in 12 new police officers, which is uh, um, huge progress. We got to do a lot more uh, than that, but uh, uh, we're moving in the right directions in terms of staffing. I think we're basically hitting bottom in terms of staffing at the police bureau. And then over the next several years, we'll get better and better. Um, at the same time, this is going to be a multi-year process. You know, even if I hire a police officer today, it takes about two years to train them. So that cop is not going to be out and on the streets um, interacting with the public um, until 2024, 2025. So it's a slow process, but we're well engaged on that. And I think after spinning our wheels for, frankly, a couple of years, we're, we're finally starting to, um, to make some progress there. The other uh, um, thing around public safety that I really want to highlight is uh, this year, uh, um, 
we have uh, made the decision and put aside the dollars to hire uh, more unarmed police officers. So we'll have a couple of dozen of those folks coming online. Um, if you follow the public safety space uh, closely, these are what we call the PS3s. These are uh, uh, police officers, but they don't carry guns. For the most part, they focus in on cold crimes and um, auto thefts. So if you've ever had the misfortune of getting your car stolen and then got it back, you probably got it back thanks to the work of police our, of our PS3 teams. We're going to, uh, I think, bring on 22, uh, if not more, new PS3s over the course of the next of the next several months. Um, and here, the, the, the news there is great. Uh, um, the interest in um, applying for those jobs has been quite high. And also, I can onboard those folks much more quickly than I can, ha than I can a police officer. A police officer, as I said, takes about two years. I can train and onboard a unarmed police officer in four months. So um, we're already hiring those folks, bringing them online. By the time we get to the fall, uh, we should have um, dramatically increased uh, the number of PS3s out there. One of the great things about PS3s, in addition to helping with cold crimes and auto thefts and things like that, is while they do that work, they also free up um, the labor of armed police officers. So they actually contribute to uh, the staffing numbers that we need to get at. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I'm sure you all saw um, headlines over the weekends. I think we had three homicides, which is tragic. Um, and there's just no way to get around the fact that um, gun violence in this town is way too high. And we have to um, keep bringing that number down as one of our North Stars. Um, second issue that I'd like to um, highlight today is houselessness. Again, um, anytime you leave your home in Portland, uh, you are confronted with this. Going into 2022, um, I had a goal of getting 1,000 houseless people off the street uh, by the end of this calendar year. Um, and to put that number into context, I think according to our latest uh, homeless census, uh, if we go back a year ago, we probably had about 5,000 houseless people sleeping on the streets. Um, I want to get about 20% of them off the streets uh, um, by the time we get to New Year's. And I think we are going to accomplish that. Um, and there are a couple of projects that bring us um, in that direction. Um, first, you know, one of the reasons why Portland looks so chaotic over the last several years is that because of COVID, uh, we were social distancing in our shelters. So we lost about half of our shelter space uh, because of uh, social distancing requirements. Um, thank goodness those have sort of started to loosen up a little bit. So we're able to increase our capacity in shelters. So that's helping a lot. Um, Commissioner Dan Ryan um, is also championing um, our safe rest villages um, within the next calendar year. Um, I sure hope that we'll be able to stand up six rest, safe rest villages. These are kind of um, camps I'm sure you've seen or at least read about them. Uh, these are tiny house villages, uh, which will house houseless folks. We have a couple up and going now. We have more in the pipeline. And once we um, once we uh, get them all stood up, that should be able to house about 360 houseless people. And the vision here is that folks who are currently living on the streets could move into one of these uh, uh, safe rest villages, receive intensive treatment um, and support for about six months, which will help them transition into more stable housing. Very excited and interested to see that project up and going. And the other good uh, piece of good news is that um, I think within the, um, by the end of the year, I think the city in partnership with the county will be able to stand up a new behavioral resource center downtown, which will both be a place where houseless people can um, congregate during the day, and there also will be new shelter beds available or new housing uh, um, associated with that space too. Um, and uh, when you add all those numbers up, it gets us awfully close to a thousand. In fact, I think we'll do better than getting a thousand folks off the streets uh, um, by the end of the year. Um, our attitude and approach to this has also shifted quite dramatically. If you have been following recent developments in, for example, Old Town Chinatown, which for the last two years has been um, completely overwhelmed and frankly broken by um, 
the human tragedies that we've seen on the streets. Um, we've learned a lot by um, trying to serve that population. I think we've gotten much better there. If you've gone through Old Town Chinatown um, recently, you'll see far fewer tents and uh, people in distress on the streets. I, you know, I won't lie to you and tell you that you won't see any tents or you won't see anyone who isn't going through a mental health crisis. But one of the things that we discovered is that if we really um, flood those zones with outreach workers, um, who try to connect people with uh, um, places to go. Uh, um, for the most part, we're seeing a pickup of about 40% of the folks who are out there on the streets of even Old Town are accepting our help, moving in, beginning to transition off the streets. Um, some folks, you know, decline our help, um, and that is quite unfortunate. But um, uh, uh, um, but we're actually seeing these numbers begin to move in the right direction. Um, and the third thing that I, I want to point out, um, and I'm proud of, and has been a top priority for my office, would be livability issues. Just the graffiti and litter that we see out um, on the streets. In um, our last budget, we um, devoted um, literally millions and millions of new dollars towards picking up the trash, getting graffiti uh, um, off the buildings. I think if you walk around, um, especially downtown, but in other communities too, you're beginning to see that begin to change. And the good news is uh, we have a lot more resources in the pipeline. This is gonna be a steady uh, um, campaign to try to get the graffiti, the litter, the needles off the sidewalks. Uh, we're making good progress, you know, um, Portland uh, looks the way it looks um, because for about two years we really weren't doing basic maintenance on the city, but that has begun to change and we're actually devoting the resources that's needed to actually push these uh, uh, um, livability efforts over the finish line. So there's a lot of good news there. Um, there that does not mean that um, you know, uh, homicides, houselessness, or livability issues have gone away. But I do think that we are finally at a point where um, the, we're beginning to uh, um, bend the curve and move in the right direction. Um, and I could go on talking like this for another 45 minutes, but I, I know that you all um, have questions and concerns that you'd like to highlight. So what I'd like to do now is to um, open this up to have more of a dialogue. So if anyone has any questions or concerns, I encourage you to raise your hand like Lynn just did. You can also drop a um, comment or a question into the chat and we'll try to get to Get to that uh, event will um, act as our uh, as our traffic director. Uh, but I did see that Glenn's ha hand went up first, so I think I can I can call on Glenn to get us started. Hey, Glenn, thanks for being here today. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Commissioner, for all the good work uh, that you're doing. Uh, certainly, things are looking up in Portland, even though there, there, there's much to be done. Uh, my question. Uh, is regarding the 911 call center and yeah. the Portland Street response. Sure. Even though tents are getting better and we're seeing less and less of them on the street, I've been noticing an increase of people just laid out on the sidewalk, just almost like unconscious. It's not yeah. a day doesn't go by where I don't see somebody just on the sidewalk. I, I don't know what they're doing, but it's been a remarkable change than I've seen before. And I live in Northwest Portland and I, and I walk everywhere. So I, I get to see what the streets look like. So this concerns me. And I, some people, I, I see them just like basically spread eagle, just like on the sidewalk. So what I'd like to do is call Portland Street Response and have them do like, like a welfare check. But then when I do that, I, I feel guilty that I'm using up a 911 number. Oh. Because we all know 911. Yeah. You know, there's issues with that and people that certainly need, obviously the guy that's on the sidewalk probably needs the help, but not compared to maybe a fire or a gunshot or, or, or something like that. So my question is, is it okay for, for me to use 911 when I see somebody laid out on the sidewalk or if they're in a mental health crisis and yelling in, in the street or should I do something else? But I, I still wanna use, you know, get help for this individual. 
Well, absolutely. Number one, Glenn, uh, um, thank you for being here and thank you for your incredibly humane instincts. And yes, you should call 911 when you see someone displayed out um, on uh, on the sidewalk. And frankly, the only way you can get Cortland Street response um, out there, and those are the appropriate folks to send to a call like that, um, is to call 911. Um, you know, first, let me put put uh, Portland Street response into a little bit of context for you. Um, this is a brand new um, uh, um, first responder system the city has uh, stood up in the last year or so. Um, the notion here is that instead of sending a cop out to respond to someone who was sleeping on the street or having some sort of mental health crisis, we send out a trained medical professional, uh, um, also someone who has training in crisis uh, de-escalation or whatnot. Uh, you might remember this started as a pilot project in Lentz, and then over the last six months or so, we've actually expanded it citywide. Um, uh, um, so all of this is great. Um, one of the things that you should do if you see someone who needs help like that is to uh, um, call 911. We'll get someone out there um, and you shouldn't be shy with that. The other thing, which I will, uh, um, I have to own because I literally do own this, is that, um, you know, there is, our call volumes on 911 are up 40%. Uh, compared to where they were uh, before um, the pandemic. Uh, so often when you call, you will um, face a wait. Um, we are working awfully hard to fix that. Um, I think that uh, we are beginning to make incremental progress in, in terms of bringing those numbers down. And if someone has a 911 question, I'd love to get into that with you. But we basically have people, we have new technology coming online. We have new staff coming online. We have new services coming online. All of that will reduce your 911 wait times. Uh, um, but if you see someone who needs help um, on the mental health side or the houseless side, uh, Portland Street Response is the answer. They're up. They're uh, working seven days a week. And you should definitely give us a call for that. Yeah, you know, I, I really think this is the way, that at least one of the legs, I guess, to, to help the, the mental, you know, the crisis that we have on the street. As long as people use it, I, I, I think this is just a great idea. And I'll tell you, I'll share this one thing where I, 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 I want to get to other questions. One of the other things we're discovering with Portland Street Response as we scale it up is that it, um, it's awfully busy. So uh, um, we're just like we have trouble um, having enough uh, cops out there to respond to our uh, um, crime calls. I think we're already beginning to get into the zone where it's increasingly difficult uh, to get uh, um, um, Portland street response teams to all the places they need to be. Um, this is a normal and natural product of trying to um, launch new programs. Uh, uh, so be patient, but uh, um, we're moving in the right direction. Okay, and thank you. Sure, no problem. Okay, and I'm actually going to alternate the chat questions because there's a lot of them in there. Um, sure. And I saw Jane had put one like right as we started. Um, so Jane Monson or Monsoon, I'm sorry if I'm mis mispronouncing your name. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read it and let the commissioner answer. So after months of lobbying for charter reform, some of the same people are now telling us that we should not vote for it, even though the fiasco over street trees between environmental services, your bureau, yep. and urban forestry, Carmen Rubio's bureau, seems to be a perfect example of why I should vote for it. It is not clear from the latest news coverage why including ranked voting and multiple member districts justifies putting city charter reform on hold again. What specifically is the problem with including these items on the charter reform ballot? Sure, um, great question. And I actually agree with your analysis. Um, you know, uh, um, in November, all of us will uh, get our ballots in the mail. One of the questions which will be on the ballot is, um, this uh, proposal to uh, change our charter. You can think of the charter as being like the constitution for the city uh, of Portland. And I'll tell you, uh, um, the constitution for the city of Portland is in desperate need of reform. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in this room know that Portland has a unique form of government. It's called a commission form of government. Uh, we are the last uh, local municipality in America to use this form of government. Um, and uh, what it means and the way things work in Portland is that instead of having kind of, you probably think that we have one mayor and four members of city council, but because of the commission form of government, we actually have 
five different mayors. You know, I started today talking about how I'm the commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau, Environmental Services, and 911. And that's how every service in the city is divided up. You have a, an elected official who's in charge of a handful of city bureaus. Now, one of the challenges when you're trying to run a city is that if you want to serve the public or if you want to solve important public problems, often you need to get um, multiple bureaus to work together. Uh, houselessness is an example I like to talk about all the time. Uh, you know, we have programs out there that uh, specifically serve the houseless community. Those are operated by uh, Commissioner Ryan's office. On the other hand, um, if you are, if you have pitched your tent on the sidewalk, uh, um, that is in the right of way, and the right of way is controlled by PBOT, uh, um, which is Commissioner Hardesty's uh, domain. And if that sidewalk happens to be in a park, um, uh, we have Commissioner Rubio, who is the uh, uh, commissioner in charge of parks. So if you want to have um, a coherent response to public safety or houselessness problems like that. You need to get all um, three of those bureaus and frankly, a couple more to work together. And our very form of government prevents us from doing that. Um, as you, for those of you who've known me for a while, um, I have been a champion of charter reform for years at this point. Um, that's one of the first things I started talking about. Um, and after about a year of, um, after a year of, um, of work by a group of volunteers, who all of whom I know quite well and who I, I know uh, uh, um, did their best thinking, we came up with a set of proposals, um, some of which I like a lot, um, some of which I have questions about, and some of which I'm kind of disappointed in. So when you get your ballot in November, you're going to uh, see a package of proposals that call for a couple of things. And a couple of these things I like a lot, like um, hiring a city manager. And basically, a city manager is how most other municipalities get around the bureau problem. So instead of having five different uh, um, individuals and five different elected officials in charge of city bureaus, you have one. Um, professional manager who's charged with coordinating the day-to-day -day operations of city services. Um, that would make us much better. Really glad to see that in there. Um, another thing that you'll see in the proposal is to um, increase the number of people who serve on Portland City Council. You know, we've had uh, a mayor and four members of council since 1911. I think the uh, Charter Review Commission wants to bump that up to 12. You know, I don't know if 12 is too many or not enough, but I agree with the basic principle that, um, uh, um, that uh, um, it's time to increase the size of council, especially because in the last hundred years, Portland has grown a hundredfold, so they are probably tenfold. Uh, so it, it really is time, I think, to get more voices and more divorce, uh, uh, um, um, diverse voices on council. What I had really hoped, and frankly, what I kind of expected, and what frankly pretty much every other jurisdiction in America does in a situation like this, is you might uh, move towards increasing the number of seat seats on council and elect them through single member districts. So you might have neighborhood based electoral districts. So you might have uh, a, a, um, a, a city council person who represents Northeast Portland or the West Hills or whatnot. Um, I should say, for those of you who don't follow the details of this right now, every member of council runs at large. Um, so when I was out on the campaign pain trail, you know, I was probably at your, in your living room in the West Hills and out in Coley and uh, in South Portland and, and whatnot. Um, and there's some virtues to that. But I think there's also some um, uh, real benefits that would come to um, having neighborhood-based uh, uh, representation. Unfortunately, in my opinion, that's not the uh, proposal before us. Instead, what the, Charter, uh, um, what the Charter Reform Commission is proposing is that we elect these new members of council through multi-member districts. So they will divide the city up into four different districts, and each one of these districts will um, uh, elect, I think, three members of council. Um, and you know, I, it's not as clean as having a representative who represents outer East Portland or whatnot. Um, and I wish we had that, but maybe that's okay. Um, we don't have a lot of experience in America with multi-member districts, but it's not totally unheard of. Um, so I don't, I don't love it, but maybe that's okay. Um, another thing which is unique 
to the Charter Reform Commission is how you actually go about electing these members of council. You know, right now you've all voted before, you get your ballot, you put the circle next to the a lady or guy that you'd like to see represent you on council. Um, and that's pretty much how we vote on everything. Uh, the Charter Review Commission wants to do something different. They want to use uh, something called ranked choice voting. So instead of picking your uh, uh, favorite member of council, you would basically rank uh, these folks, uh, um, this, you know, Mingus is my top choice, Rubio is my second choice, Hardesty is my third choice, something like that. Um, and, you know, ranked choice voting is not unheard of in America. Um, I think there are four or five jurisdictions that use it. Uh, famously, New York City implemented ranked choice voting a couple of years ago, and frankly, their rollout was um, a little bit bumpy, if you remember that election. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts used, uses ranked choice voting, um, uh, too. So it's not completely unheard of, but let me tell you what is unheard of. Uh, the combination of multi-member districts and ranked choice voting, um, which is the new form of government which is being proposed, I'm wary here because we have not seen that anywhere in America before. And not only have we not seen this anywhere in America before, we have not seen this. I argue that there's not a form of government that looks like this anywhere on the planet. And so, you know, what's my concern? Um, and I, you can look at that. It's a very Portland kind of solution. Uh, it's very innovative, very cutting edge, but it also takes us from being like, the last city in America to use an obsolete form of government to the first city on the planet to use this brand new form of government. And frankly, you know, I'm here because I just want the city of Portland to work better. And I think the thing that's going to make us work better is, um, you know, having a city manager, increasing the number of folks who serve on council. Um, I don't know how this, I'm, I don't know how this is, is going to work. Maybe it'll work incredibly smoothly. It's pretty easy for me to um, um, imagine how it might not work smoothly and might work in ways which are um, um, unexpected. You know, for those of you who know me really, really well, you know that in my previous life, um, I was a political scientist by training and I literally modeled uh, electoral systems. And just, just honest to God, um, I can't tell you how the political dynamics of the game that they're setting up works. Um, and that's kind of a concern at a time when we're kind of going through a lot of transition and we're trying to stabilize ourselves. It would be good to just have a form of government that is kind of well-tested, well-understood. So that's where my reservations are, are at in terms of that. Um, but I literally do put that in the realm of reservations. I have questions. Um, you know, I'm talking to people who have used, you know, forms, pieces of this type of government uh, um, before, either multi-member districts, ranked choice voting. Unfortunately, unless I go to some very obscure um, elections in, you know, in New Zealand, um, or I can't see anything out in the planet that looks quite like this. Uh, so that's a concern. And the other thing that just actually really makes me, um, which I think I just flat out oppose, is the fact that, you know, we're introducing about five major reforms with charter reform, um, but it's not five separate votes. This is a take it or leave it proposal, folks. Uh, um, so even if you love the city manager, um, but hate, hate ranked choice voting, you're just going to have to decide. You're going to have to either take it, take it all or leave it all. And I think that's unfortunate. You know, if voters could say, if voters could vote separately on the city manager piece, the size of government, or the number of people on council piece, the multi-member piece, and the ranked choice piece, I think that would give me a real sense of at least what Portlanders really want. Um, and even if they make choices that I would, you know, not agree with, at least it was an intentional choice. Um, I feel like we're being kind of, um, I wish we had that choice, but right now we don't have that choice. Um, and frankly, it's not just a principled choice. I also, there is this um, principle in Oregon law that when you put something on the ballot, it has to deal with just one topic. I'd argue that this, this is dealing with more than one topic. Um, so it, it also just strikes me as uh, being inconsistent, perhaps inconsistent with the letter of the law, certainly inconsistent with the spirit of the law. 
So that's where I'm at. Um, it is, I think the, the media uh, um, has also mischaracterized this a little bit. You know, there are folks out there working in support of charter reform at this point, and they have their own committees that are up and going, and there are folks who are out there who oppose charter reform, and they're up and they have their committees, and you can volunteer on either one of those committees. I think the lane that I'm trying to uh, fill between now and November is to pull together events like this where I kind of talk about, um, you know, talk about and do public education around uh, what charter reform means to Portland. Um, you know, I think it really is a matter of what you value and how you uh, um, balance these trade-offs between, um, you know, different ideas. Um, so that was a long answer. Can you please um, elaborate a little bit on what council can do um, in the future? There's a couple questions. Oh, sure. Like that. And that's the other thing. So, um, you know, the way charter reform works is basically every 10 years we pull together a citizens committee that works independently to develop suggestions for reforming uh, our city charter. We're in one of those cycles now. Um, however, if, um, if, however, if, um, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that city council itself can't put charter, some forms of charter reform on the table. And that's one of the things that I'm looking at. Um, frankly, I'm not going to be uh, um, particularly engaged in the campaign to either pass charter reform or uh, oppose charter reform. I'll be doing public education. And frankly, I'll be thinking about the scenario of what happens if charter reform doesn't pass, because the status quo um, for how we organize our government is um, unacceptable. It is really and truly one of the reasons why Portland consistently fails on delivering basic services. Um, so if charter reform fails, one of the things I, I, I'd like to do is to uh, um, work with my colleagues on council to put together a charter reform package, which I think gets to the good government proposals um, and ideas that I'm talking about. You know, increase the size of council, single member districts, city manager. Okay, and there are a lot, a lot of questions in the chat specific to charter reform, but I do want to give the chance to um, let other people voice other concerns not related to charter reform. Sure. Um, but if you do have questions um, and you want to know of an event or um, the next time the commissioner is going to be out and about to hear more from him, um, just let you can email our office and let us know like you want to be plugged into those conversations and we'll make sure to send you some invites um but for now i think i'm going to move on from that topic um i believe edward hershey you had your hand up next i think it's ian <laughs> yes you. i i had my hand up for some I, I, okay I, and look, I think it goes with the way zoom works uh, edward can we get to you next and then we'll go to ann if they organize you Oh, according to okay. who put their hand up so we know okay it's so am i am i on or are we are uh we... you're up next we're going to go to okay Anne, good enough. and then you're, you're up thank, thank you. you and thank you for all your hard work and you're still there and working hard and you actually look great for uh being in city council it's we're a city in trauma it is hard now i appreciate you i don't know how you guys all do it uh, guys and women do, do it up there i have a great team around me and that is 100 percent the secret sauce <laughs> A couple things. I'm hearing bad things um, about the Portland Street response. You know, I'm a part of the mental health civil rights movement. How are you going to get the data and feedback of the bad things I'm hearing? They're not coming through and everything. You're not asking the questions. The data is not being asked. Um, so, and also what's more important to me is the um, discrimination in salaries. Community health workers get one hour of mental health training. That's it. Peer support specialists, 40 to 80 hours and lived experience. $30,000 difference, that's pure discrimination. So what is Portland doing? And then just a little commercial, It's I'm not paid for this, but I helped the state of Oregon actually in their planning last week, 988 will be the new mental health number. That's gonna save a lot of time on 911 and all your employees. So if people, they don't have their mobile teams built yet. In fact, we're so complicated. We have all these mobile teams. There's there's. Cascadia, there's the police, there, now it's going to be state, now the important street response. But in the if you have a mental health crisis, you see them in a mental health crisis, you can call 988 directly. And that's nationwide, all over the United States as of last Saturday. 
Um, and that again will help our volume. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be speaking and let you talk, but I wanna make sure people knew that because it's gonna help us in the long run and it'll be easier to city of Portland. Um, I see a lot of problems with the mental health things. The, the programs that you're building are building, uh, I don't think they're gonna work very well because I've been doing this for how many years? So I'm just getting that in. How are you gonna ensure they're gonna work well? How are you gonna get the data that actually works for the people? And what are you gonna do about the $30,000 difference? Uh, great questions, uh, um, Anne. Well, you know, um, Portland Street Response is still a work in progress, uh, but we are um, building Portland Street Response in a, um, evidence-based um, way. One of the things that we're doing is every six months, we uh, um, we do an evaluation. So we have a contract with Portland State, which uh, gathers data, does interviews, kind of tracks our usage numbers and uh, um, provides us with feedback there. Uh, um, so that's uh, uh, um, one of the solutions or one of the strategies that we're using to sort of um, evolve this program. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, we're actually, you know, we learn real lessons in the real world and try to implement them um, in roughly real time. Um, and one of the things I might ask you to do, um, I'm not sure when our next Portland Street Response um, evaluation is due, but I'm sure we do these every six months um, through Portland State. So I might ask you if you could send me a letter or an email um, sometime. It doesn't have to be this week or next week or even next month. Uh, um, but this will, Portland Street Response will be before council again um, in the very near future. And what we'll do there is to look at uh, the latest data for, we have from the uh, PSU evaluation and um, we'll use that as um, a stepping stone towards thinking about how we evolve this in a new direction. And I see you shaking your head. Uh, uh, They're not asking for mental health data. I've talked with the researchers, we've been through that. He said, oh, that's a great idea. They're not asking that. So it doesn't look at mental health. They're asking about houselessness. you got numbers, it's, it makes it very easy. I'm gonna let that go now because I've got all the people waiting here. They're not asking the right questions to even, uh, I saw them on the street. I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't impressed. They were smirking at people and it's sad. And we need better, and so like Glenn can call somebody who actually people won't run away from. And I, I, I thank you for your time and thank you for everybody else's time. Sure, I, and I still want that email from you. If you send me an email about the, the kinds of changes you'd like to see in Portland Street Response when they I, come I, back to us I, in the evaluation, I, I, I you, I'll raise the issue. Send you emails before your staff probably hasn't forwarded it to you. So just look in the past emails. Thank All you. right, great. Thank you. Edward, thank you for your All patience. Right. Let, me, let me apologize to Yvette in advance. Okay. There are any number of issues that I feel strongly about and every one of them is dependent on our former government. And so I can't think of a more important issue than this charter reform issue. I've left Mingus and Katie alone for the, since the election because I think you've done a, good, you've done a great job. And I, I wish there were four more of you <laughs> where you sit. But I can't imagine a proposal that was worse than what we have now. But son of a gun, somehow this group has come up with it. It's, it would be a ticket to mediocrity. And Jason and some of the others, I don't have enough time to explain what's wrong with this proposal. But my question to you, Mingus, is, isn't there anything that council can do, aside from defend the lawsuit, to change this, take it or leave it? Because I, you know, this is gonna go down and it's gonna go down big. Uh, and I'm going to be there trying to help it go down because it it's an abomination. Harry, um, I hear your frustration. Um, and the answer is no, uh, there's actually nothing council can do here. Uh, basically, the way it works is, uh, you know, city council gets to pick uh, volunteers to sit on the Charter Review Commission. There are 20 of them. Basically, each member of council gets to appoint four. And... Um, uh, they do their work for about a year. They come up with their proposals. If they have, um, if three quarters of the people who sit on that commission, so 15, um, all agree on a, a package of proposals, there's just, the rules do not allow council to um, change them. Now, if they had come in with 14 votes, we could have used the, their proposal as the baseline for 
uh, 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 a package that we could adjust a little bit, but uh, council really is stuck here. There is not a move. I've and I've talked to a lot of lawyers about it, um, I, and it's an unfortunate um, artifact of our I, form of government. I, I, else appreciate, I appreciate that. Just let me say, in, in very quickly, and I appreciate the position you're in, and 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 uh, and, and that how it governed the answer to your last question. Uh, I hope you can come out strongly against it uh, because I think that's what's required. Thanks so much. Sure. Thanks, Edward. Okay. Um, I think the next hand I saw up was Ola. Oh, I think you're. I think it's I'm seeing them in different orders. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I think it goes to top of the screen, left to right, in terms of because uh, the, the program automatically lines you up in terms of when you um, uh, when you raise your hand. So why don't we go to John? Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'm with Edward on this, I just have to say, I totally agree with him. I wish that there was a way for city council to put some kind of competing, uh, just put a single, put the city manager on the ballot as a, as a standalone thing. And it would, it would fly and we would get rid of all of this unintended consequences. This thing is just, is just awful. And it's, and it's really going to be hard for um, thoughtful people to vote for it, I think. Um, and I, now I want to apologize to people because I'm going to bring up a very parochial issue. Sure. Um, I'm here sort of representing Mount Tabor Neighborhood Association. And we reached, uh, you know, we went through a long um, struggle with the Water Bureau about the disconnection of the reservoirs. And, and we ended up in 2015 with a, with a, a with a, a negotiated settlement with the Water Bureau and the City Council that City Council backed strongly. We were assured by Commissioners Fitch, Fritz, um, uh, Mayor Hales, and Commissioner Saltzman that this had the, that we could absolutely rely on Council's word that this had the binding force of law. And the bureaus were directed to collaborate with the Neighborhood Association on two things. One is the preservation of the reservoirs, which has gone very well. And the other is an interpretive program, which has not gone well. And the Water Bureau has excluded us from participation in that. And that program is a travesty and it needs to be halted and restarted with new staff in collaboration with the Neighborhood Association. I've sent you a 18 page report on this four months ago in March. And, and what I'm hearing back from staff is, well, the Water Bureau thinks that was an earlier city council that directed us to, to uh, behave in a certain way. And it doesn't count anymore because there's a new city council. But, and, and, and they think the city council could simply override that resolution, even though we were promised, strongly promised by all of city council that it had the binding force of law and that a resolution that says within it that has a, it has the binding force of law has even more binding force of law. So we would really like to have a conversation with you about how the how to bring the Water Bureau into compliance with Council Resolution 37146. And I'd really urge you to find the time to read the report that we sent you and, and, and understand the, the issues that are at play here. We really appreciate the fact that you got into the mayor's budget that $250,000 for the study of Reservoir 6 is tremendously important and we're grateful for that. But we really want the... the we. It, it's a it, it's very discouraging for citizens who have spent years of volunteer time on something and been assured by city council that that there would be a course of action and then to have that simply abrogated by the bureau because it thinks it can and and it's your bureau and so unfortunately this buck stops with you so i hope we I, what we would really like is the chance to talk to you directly about this and not take up the time of people who are here concerned about other issues. But well, John, I accept your invitation. Um, I'll come out and uh, meet with whomever you want me to meet with, the Neighborhood Association or uh, um, whatnot. Um, Yvette handles my calendar. Um, I'll have you two talk and we'll find a time to get together. Thank you. That would be fantastic. Really much appreciated. Of course. And thank you for all your hard work. Oh. And, uh, you know, we love having you on council and it just like, I just want to 
get your attention to this issue. Thank you. I love being on council and uh, uh, um, I, work how I, I work, but I also want to acknowledge Jackson and Yvette and Katie. Um, I don't know if Cold Ann is on this call. Uh, I got a lot of uh, really great people supporting me. So um, it really is the privilege of my life. Bad. Tad. Hello, Commissioner Maps. Thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us. I know that you work nine to five and long hours. I was thrilled to vote for you. And uh, really, it's wonderful that you take this time. I want you as a man that's full of compassion, to just imagine yourself now the father of children in Ukraine. And a bomb goes off and your four-year-old daughter is killed in a stroller and your wife is losing her leg. And what on earth has the world come to? The evil uh, is almost satanic. Um, and this is the 21st century. We hope that we had left this before. Uh, alone uh, 80 years ago in World War II. Now, I want to take you back to World War II. Imagine Poland has just been invaded. And what do the people in Poland think about the Americans that are still in sister city relationships with Germany or in German American cultural associations? And they're just going along like life is just normal. Well, it isn't normal. We don't really have much we can do, but we know that Russia uses every institution for propaganda purposes, and it denies uh, its citizens the right to a free and independent uh, media. So the only thing we can do here in Portland is to fly our Ukrainian flags, to have our Ukrainian bumper stickers, and we can give them a very clear message that we don't agree with evil by ending our sister city relationship. So what is your position on this? And will you promise to meet with us? Um, Ted, I'm aware of the um, this issue space. I haven't given it a lot of thought or had a briefing on it, uh, um, but um, I complete as the, as a dad of a 11 year old and a 13 year old um, and someone who is very much a world citizen, uh, um, the scenario that you spun out uh, is one that I think of, um, all of the time. Um, I What I can pledge to you today is that I will take some time to, um, uh, um, I will take some time to learn about this. And uh, yes, I would, um, I would meet with you or your, if you have a larger group, uh, um, uh, we can set up a time to uh, discuss the dynamics around this. I'm not even sure, um, Frankly, which bureau has? If, I'm not sure if that's in the mayor's portfolio or how how this works. But we can uh, I, you can educate me. You you made yourself accessible. Jackson's been wonderful. I con contacted him. He wrote a thoughtful uh, prompt email reply on this call. You have uh, Tracy Goodman, who just out of her own time started a petition that's already gotten over 900 people to uh, support ending Portland City Sister. You've got Tatiana Turtle, uh, who is from Ukraine and has many friends and she'll happily tell you everything. She just met with President Biden and uh, she, she, can, she can be trusted to give you an honest assessment. Uh, also, Eric Liebman's on this call tonight. All four of us are here because we want to make sure that you're fully educated. So um, should I contact Jackson? Um, yeah. to, to, okay, but um, so what you're saying is that you will promise to educate yourself and you'll promise to meet with us. I will. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'm going to butt in because he just brought my name up. Sorry. When will you be able to meet with us? Can we get a confirmation on a time? Are you Not totally at this moment. <laughs> I'm a scheduler and that um, <laughs> it will probably honestly, realistically be about a month to a month and a half out just because we're booked that far in advance um but just please follow up via email that way we have you um in queue to make that happen it's just yeah. me, huh. yeah. doesn't have a month uh, yeah this yeah. is really this is this is something um even commissioner maps if it's only 15 minutes to look you in the eye and to give you a stack of articles if necessary to answer any of your questions please can you make 15 minutes available to us in the next 10 days. Uh, yeah, cool. you know, and before you answer that, I just want to let you guys know, because if you don't know, 
Um, I think this is important to understand. Portland's sister city is the home to one of the Russian troops that raped, tortured, and murdered the citizens in Bucha. And yet the city has not severed ties with them. And I can go on and on and on and tell you these things. And all of I heard back is we, uh, we don't want to basically isolate some of the people in Russia. Um, we don't want to isolate the sister city. I've read all kinds of uh, responses to this. This is pretty important and it's pretty imperative. And I highlight what Ted said, even 15 minutes. But dude, Here. this is Commissioner. This is not We'll say we can absolutely look into the commissioner's schedule and see if we can make that time. If not, I'm sure there are plenty of members of staff who would be happy to meet with you guys. We, yeah, would, okay, we, um, we would respectfully request 15 minutes with Commissioner Maps. He is a you. wonderful man. He, he's a compassionate man and he knows this is important and he's got lots of little 15 minute things. We'll be there if it's 7, 15 in the morning or uh, 7, 15 at night, anytime in between. You, you want us, we'll be there. Uh, just give us a couple days notice, please. All right. Um, I, uh, Tad, Tracy, I'm going to ask, uh, um, I'm going to ask Jackson and Yvette to work with you guys to find, uh, um, to, to find uh, uh, um, a time to do it. Um, and I, I, I would say we'll, I literally am booked from 6.30 in the morning to nine every night. Seven sure, we'll take 6 a.m. That's right. 6 a.m. <laughs> well, uh, um, it, I'll, let, I'll let you two, I'll let uh, you four uh, figure it out. Um, I pretty much go where I'm told to go. Um, so I'll let you folks uh, uh, um, find a time and uh, put it on my calendar and I'll be there. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Okay, we're in the final five minutes. So if people can keep their questions to five, like one minute um, so that we can get through as many people as possible. Um, I wanna go to Ola because I called her name earlier um, and I see other names that kind of come in before you or after you. So I don't know how the screen works, but <laughs> Ola, you're next. Can you hear us? Hola, are you there? There. There we go. Um, everybody, including you, Mingus Maps, agrees that charter reform is the most important thing, but you sort of wrote it off in a quite self-serving way. First of all, you said there were five issues. What are the two other issues besides rank voting, which in fact, is a very fair way to vote. And I think the ranked voting, you just vote for the two, your two top ones. It gets rid of primaries, it saves money, and it allows people that are not rich to run for city office. The second thing is, right now, I have no representation on the city council. All city council members could live on the same street. So why make the perfect the enemy of the good um, we've all agreed, I think, in this room, in, in this thing, that we need a city manager. We also need more than four people, five people on a city council. Why not at least pass this thing? You can make tweaks with it afterwards, but I think you're really wrong on ranked voting. And I wish, so my question to you, what are your two other issues that you say were in it? I read that there are three main issues, not five. Well, in terms of here, the in terms of the five issues, and by issues, I mean separate and distinct questions. Uh, and what I'm saying is uh, there is this general principle, uh, which I think is both good public policy and good democracy and written into law that says when you put something on the ballot, it has to be on a single topic. I would make the argument that say, uh, hiring a city manager and ranked choice voting are two really distinct questions. And at least in, according to my interpretation of the law and, um, and certainly my interpretation of the spirit of the law, normally you would see those broken out into two separate votes. Uh, so that's what I, I, I meant there in terms of, of issues. If you were to sort of go through and take a look at the number of, uh, I think, um, categorical uh, substantive changes here, um, you know, I, I probably, I, I don't know if I said five, but there are probably many more than five. We didn't even kind of get into um, 
the changes in the, in the mayor's uh, uh, um, powers and portfolio. So that's the, the principle there. Uh, by issues, I wasn't saying the problems, uh, um, although I did express skepticism about multi-member districts and rank, rank choice voting, and we might just disagree on that. Uh, but the principle I was trying to get at that I think you're pointing to is um, this: it, the, the ballot measure is one vote, but it deals with multiple topics, which is, um, at least in my interpretation of the law, actually not the way elections in Oregon are supposed to uh, work. But frankly, um, this is going to court. Um, I'm not part of that lawsuit at all. A judge will take a look at it and, and make a determination as to whether or not this is, a, these all, uh, even though they deal with disparate topics, actually come together as a, um, a single issue or can be voted to gone. You know, this is where actually just being a, ultimately lawyers will just decide this one. Uh, um, and that's fine. And then we all get the choice of, if it is a single issue, um, uh, then, you know, we'll go to the ballot and vote yes or no. Um, you know, if the judge says you need to break this up into five different votes, I think that would be, I, that was definitely my preference. Um, but I will hey, let Thanks very much for answering my question. Thank sure. you. Okay, and then David, I think you are up next. Hi, Mangus and staff. Hope hey, David, good to okay. see you. So, quick question. I know we're running out of time. Uh, so I'll you, stay late. You, you mentioned uh, earlier uh, that, you know, there's a possibility the thing may go down, the vote, vote may go down, and that there may be a, something happened after that. What? I mean, who, who could propose a, a, a change after that? Is, is that something the council can do? Or sure, that, they're, you talk they're about a private entity. Um, there are two paths. There are two theoretical paths to uh, um, charter reform if you don't go through the charter reform commission. Uh, one is a uh, city council can put um, um, a charter reform proposal on the table, which is actually um, happens all the time. Uh, you might remember um, uh, that we have uh, a public financing for local campaigns now, which is something which Amanda uh, um, uh, got you know two other votes on council. It's a change to the charter. Got it passed, and it's fine. And there are actually a couple of other things like that. So uh, council could do it, and frankly, that is pretty straightforward. Um, and then also you could follow the um, initiative uh, route, where if you go, I forget how many thousands of signatures, a lot. Uh, but if you go out and get enough signatures, uh, just citizens could put it on the ballot too. Um, and I will tell you. Um, I'm interested in trying to see if I can find a consensus on council uh, to put something uh, before voters. And I think that um, if this fails, I think people realize, the current council realizes that there's the problems that we have are acute enough that uh, I think I could probably find two votes for that. And I, I will also tell you just from being out in the community, I, I think there are citizens groups that are uh, worked up enough uh, that they would be, um, Inter they're interested in doing their own ballot initiative campaign where you go out and gather 50,000 signatures or, or, or whatnot. So those are the two routes to, to watch. Um, at this point, um, I think everyone is watching and waiting to see what um, uh, um, the voters do in November. Thank you. Sure. And I know we're at time, but I'd like if I can quickly deal with Tim or I get Tim's question and Eric's question, uh, uh, um, then uh, uh, because you have been so patient, I, I feel obliged to do that. And then I can let everyone go and uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Tim, are you there? All right, Ted can have my time because, excuse me, uh, the other gentleman can have my time because Ted brought up all my issues on Ukraine. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate your generosity yeah. there. Tim, are you um, are you on the call? We'll give Tim Tim a couple of seconds. All right, we might have lost Tim. Um, 
in which case we're a little bit over time. So this is a, a perfect moment for me to just say um, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, thank you uh, for the questions and the dialogue. Um, this is literally what democracy looks like. Um, I feel like I learned a lot today. Um, I will be following up with some of you um, around some of the, the specific uh, topics that we, we discussed. Uh, so I look forward to uh, uh, um, seeing you, Tad, and I look forward to meeting with folks who uh, uh, um, want to talk about reservoir related issues. Um, I also really want to um, thank you for sticking with Portland and sticking uh, with the process. I completely get that the last several years have been uh, the most challenging years in Portland's history. Um, but I also believe that we've made important progress in the last six months in particular. And I will tell you that I am literally never been more optimistic about the future of Portland than I am today. Um, it's taken a lot of hard work by a lot of good people, but we have some, um, I think, really solid plans in place. Uh, um, I think we have the right culture now. Um, I think that Portland's brightest days are ahead, but the only way we can get there is by uh, working together and having the kind of conversations that we had tonight. So um, thank you all for uh, this dialogue. Uh, we try to do these every Every couple of months. So please, uh, uh, um, if you can tolerate me, I'd love it if you uh, visited us again. And uh, I hope that we can uh, do some of these uh, in the real world too, because I'd love to uh, uh, um, see you in person. And with that, I'll hand the floor back to Yvette.